Today's event is called Podcasting for Nonprofits, Amplify Your Mission. Podcasting can be a way for nonprofit organizations to connect with listeners and constituents in a new way. Our guests will share lessons and tips for nonprofit organizations who want to embark on podcasting. And now I'd like to introduce our guest. Anna Jaworski is Executive Director of Hearts Unite the Globe, or HUG, a nonprofit organization for the congenital heart defect, CHD, community. Anna's son was born with a life threatening condition, and she has been writing and speaking about it for over two decades. As part of her work, she is the host of Heart to Heart with Anna and the executive producer of Bereaved But Still Me and other podcasts. In the last eight years, she has gone from having a program on Voice America to taking total control of her podcast and growing three other podcasts to boot all to amplify the mission and the work of the congenital heart defect community. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome our guest, Anna Jaworski. Let's give our best hands welcome to Anna. Thank you so much, Susanna. It is such an honor to be here. I'm very excited to meet with you all. I've been a member of TechSoup for, golly, Oh, I think about seven or eight years myself. So I appreciate what TechSoup does. And this is very exciting for me. This is my first time to attend a regional meeting. But now that I know about you all, I might be coming back to other meetings, Susanna, if I'm welcome. So first of all, let me start by asking why somebody should podcast. Podcasts are amazing. Believe it or not, there are over 2 million podcasts being produced today. That just amazed me when I heard that statistic. Now, to be fair, even though there are 2 million podcasts out there, only about 1 million of them are active, but that's still an awful lot of podcasts. And it's a great way to reach your audience quickly and to reach them regularly. So one way to reach your audience is through stories. And this is something that we know with TechSoup. TechSoup provides lots of different software and even hardware too, to help you to reach your nonprofit constituents. And this is a way that you can do it through telling stories. This is a way to make your nonprofit come alive in the lives of the people that you serve and the people who wanna know more about you. So Susanna already told you a little bit about me. I have been, podcasting for eight years. My program is called Heart to Heart with Anna. It is not a relationship podcast exactly. It is a relationship podcast because I have an interview-based podcast where I talk to other members of the congenital heart defect community. And it has been an amazing experience for me. Congenital heart defects are the number one birth defect, but most people don't realize that. So by having a podcast, I can raise awareness. I interview all kinds of people from my community, from patients to parents, grandparents, the doctors who serve our children, both congenital um, pediatric cardiologists, as well as adult cardiologists who specialize in the care of children who were born with congenital heart defects all the way up through adulthood. And even as they age and get much older and start to have acquired heart disease as well. It's very interesting. I also love to talk to siblings, to authors and nurses. It's really wonderful. I, I have a chance to go all over the spectrum, meeting people from all different niches in the podcast. And what's great about podcasting is I can talk to people all over the world. In fact, if you listen to the podcast that went live today, you may have trouble understanding it. And that's because today I featured my very first podcast in, in Norwegian. Last week, the gentleman who is bilingual came on my program and spoke in English. Today's show was actually in Norwegian. He talked to a heart mom who told me about him to begin with. And she conducted the interview in Norwegian and he was able to respond in his native tongue, which was really exciting. One of the things that is great about podcasting is that 
you can get a chance to tell people about your nonprofit in a very relaxed and natural way. So I do these interviews and get a chance to tell people about all the resources that they need to know about in the congenital heart defect community. And then for 30 seconds, just a smidgen, I stick in a little bit about Heart Unite the Globe and what we do, and I give them my website. I also have show notes, which are a description of my show. And that is another way they can just click in the show notes. They can click on the link and that will take them to my website where they can learn even more about my program. So that's one thing that's really awesome about podcasting that is different than if you're giving a speech like I am right now. Although Suzanne is being great and in the chat, she's able to put the link so you all can click in it there, which is really cool as well. Now, some of my volunteers are former guests. So if you're looking for volunteers for your nonprofit and you do an interview-based show like I do, it might be a way that you can actually get more volunteers. So I've had over 116,000 hits from all over the world, and that is my audience. Those are people who are receiving help from me in a way that I never could have done one-on-one. -on -one just giving speeches or even through some of the books that I have put together. And that's what actually brought me into podcasting. So how is podcasting different than giving us podcast could be interactive. Like I said, I have a guest driven show, therefore I am the host and I interview and talk with my guest. I get a chance to be an active listener, which is really special and not usually what you do when you're just giving a presentation. It's usually you just being the person who is speaking and other people listen and you can watch if they're nodding their heads while you're talking, but it's not the same as when you're doing a podcast and you're actively listening and sharing information, both yourself and your guest, which I think I really, I just love. I've done live shows before. That's another platform that you can consider. But live shows are scary <laughs> because if something can go wrong in a live show, it will go wrong when I'm doing a live show. Another type that you can do is, is through host-driven show, like the Rush Limbaugh show or any of those shows where the person who is talking is the show and he or she gives you their opinions on things, but they don't necessarily have guests who come in. So those are some of the different things. Now, there are some new things that are available now that weren't available when I first started podcasting. One of them is called, it's an app called Discourse. And those of you who are out there may already be familiar with it. One of the things that some of the podcasters I've spoken to really is they go out on Discourse and when their show is broadcast, they have a listening party and they listen with the other people who want to hear their show. And they're able to have a conversation about the show while the show is going on through chats, which I think is really cool. So it's definitely a way that you can reach your audience and it's, it can be very interactive and very effective. So why would you want to start a podcast and what does success look like to you? That's something that's really important to know at the very beginning and I didn't really know that. When I first started my podcast, my intention was to sell books. I had a company called Baby Hearts Press and I wrote books for the congenital heart defect community, but I noticed that I wasn't really selling as many books as I wanted to. So when a producer reached out to me and said, hey, would you like to have your own radio show? Because eight years ago, we didn't use the term podcast. I was interested. And he told me that this would be a way that I could sell books. So initially that was my why. What my why was to sell books. And so success for me would have been selling books. Unfortunately, I didn't sell as many books as I thought I would, but I decided to continue podcasting because what I realized was I was reaching more people through the podcast than I was with my books. And I felt that I was doing a greater deed of sharing resources with the congenital heart defect community, which is what Hug or Heart Unite the Globe is all about. So I was able to realize my mission so much better through the podcast than I was simply through my books. But I didn't really know what success meant to me. Initially, it meant selling books. But then when I changed my focus, 
my husband and I talked about it and I said, if I even reach only one other family, one other family like ours, who has a child with a heart defect, who maybe feels very alone, who is scared and their kid is in the hospital and they don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And then they hear a story about Alex or they hear a story about Lasse, the gentleman who is featured on my podcast today. And they see Lasse made it to 35. Alex made it to 27. And they feel uplifted. It's worth it. It's totally worth it. But that's naive. (laughs) Only healthy one person. I didn't keep stats at first. But then I realized I really need to know stats because I need to know what's working and what isn't working. What kind of shows do people like to listen to? What shows are being ignored? And then that gives me an opportunity to improve the quality of my show. So when you're considering putting a podcast together, think about that. Why do you want to do it? Who do you want to reach? What will success look like for you? For some people, it's through sales. Like what I had hoped mine would be initially through selling books, which it wasn't. But maybe it's through donations. Maybe you're selling a class. Maybe it's just a numbers game. Maybe you just want to know that you've reached 25, 50, 100 people every single time you put out a show. So I think it helps at the beginning when you decide you want to have a podcast to know why you're doing it and what success will mean to you. So let's move on to discuss the nitty gritty. So now I know I want to have a podcast. I know why I want to do it. I know what success is going to mean to me, but how in the world do I get started? First, you decide, do you want interview-based, host-based, a live program? Because the type of format you want to use dictates some of the equipment that you need to have. So that's one of the things that you need to decide. But what else? What about a microphone? As you see, I'm doing this presentation and you don't see a microphone. But if you know about AirPod Pros, the microphone is actually built into my little AirPod. These little things are amazing. And initially, when I first started, I used a standalone microphone and a headset, kind of, and I had a standalone microphone. Then I graduated to my Sennhauser which was a headset with a boom microphone. But since I've gotten my AirPod Pros, they surpass the quality of either of those two devices. So as you start podcasting, you may change your equipment, but you could start out with something as simple as some AirPod Pros and and that is just perfectly fine. You will sound good enough that everybody can understand you. Now, a lot of people ask me, okay, so I've got my microphone, I've got my format, but what do I do? How do I do this? So you are going to need some software. If you have a device like this is called a Zoom device, this actually has microphones built in and you can record directly on this and it has a little card that goes into it that you can put into your computer that has all of your audio files. Likewise, I have this device. It's called a Rode. Rode makes this device. It's a German company. And this plugs directly into my iPhone. It has a lightning source cord. And then this has little lavalier mics that plug into it. And you can do your whole podcast with your phone. It's just amazing. And this has on your phone, a little track for each individual speaker that has the lavalier mic and you can download it to your computer. You'll have to download the software that goes with that, those devices in order to be able to use it. Or you can use a program called Audacity. It's a free program that you can get online and you can import MP3s. You can import a WAV files, a variety of different audio files, and then you can edit straight from that. I have recently been using a new program called Descript. This one is not free. We'll give you three hours free. And then after that, you have to pay for it. But Descript is great because you can import your audio files and it translates them into a text file. And you can edit straight from the text file instead of having to edit from the audio file. It's absolutely fabulous. And here's something great. 
it is now doing something like 26 different languages. So when I had my Norwegian show, the guest host, Heidi Norwegian, was able to sit down with me. And in a few hours, we were able to take her program and completely edit it, even though I don't know Norwegian. Because it turned it into a transcript, she was able to help me edit the program together. Now, even after I have finished using Audacity or Descript, I tend to not be completely satisfied with the sound quality. So I use another program that is actually web-based and it's called Ophonic. Don't worry about writing all of this down. Any of you who want a handout later, Susanna will be putting my email in the chat and I will send you a handout that has a lot of this information so you don't have to worry about how did she spell Ophonic? It'll be in the handout that I share with you. So through Ophonic, they take all of the different levels because most of my guests are calling in by phone or we're in a Zoom call and they may not have the same kind of microphone that I have. So their sound quality may not be as good. With Ophonic, it takes the levels and it will raise them up so that we sound like we are in the same room and it eliminates some of the background noise. It's absolutely wonderful. I couldn't live without Ophonic. It does so much for me today. I do everything on my MacBook Pro, but you don't have to have a Mac product. You see, I have my iPhone, I have Rode, which is with the iPhone. I love Macs, but you don't have to. People do it on lots of different devices. In fact, this Zoom is not specific to a Mac or to a PC. So you probably will want to have a computer that will definitely make your life a lot easier. You don't necessarily have to have a mixer. I have a mixer, but I don't really use it. I prefer to just use my AirPod Pros and to use the software that I've mentioned already. Now you may wonder how much money does it cost to actually have a studio? I was telling Susanna <laughs> before we got started and Mark that I'm a little bit embarrassed because my studio is actually a roll top desk in a teeny tiny nook between my husband's garage and my garage. And we actually put, I don't know if I should show this to you, a carton foam on the walls to help soundproof my walls. It's all around me. And my fourth wall is a curtain. <laughs> so you don't have to spend a ton of money on your studio. I am embarrassed to admit that in an effort to have superior sound quality, I have done everything from recording in a closet, recording under a blanket. I have tried so many different ways of recording to try and make the sound quality good. There are lots of different videos to teach you how you can improve your sound quality and different things that you can do to have good sound quality. So you don't have to spend a fortune on your studio. Now, some people want to do a live show and that, like I said, that's one of the things that you will want to know is how you want to do it. If so, you may want to use a platform like Voice America, Blood Talk Radio, Spreaker, a number of these different platforms will let you actually have a studio that you can record in and there will be numbers that your guests can call in so that they can speak to you. I am starting to run out of time. So I'm going to go pretty quickly here. I am offering a workshop in the fall. And any of you who are interested in a workshop, I'll be able to dive a lot deeper, but at least I wanted to give you a chance to understand some of the information that goes into making a podcast and why you would want it for your nonprofit. One of the questions that a lot of people ask me is, should I write a script or should I go totally off the cuff? I write a script. I do that because there are a lot of advantages, such as being more succinct, eliminating a lot of filler words that make it boring to listen to you. And also I can always make sure that I am hitting exactly what is important to my guest and what is important to me and my listeners. There are some disadvantages. Sometimes my guests get really nervous. So when I send them a script, so they know what questions I'm going to ask you, they just read from the script and you can almost hear the terror in their voice which kind of makes not a great listening experience. But if you warm your guests up, then you can avoid that situation. I have a script writing team that helps me. And we actually have a form that is a guest intake form where they tell me their life story as much as they want to tell me and why they're an expert to come on my show and what they want to talk about. 
Then my script writing team and I sit down, we use that form to create the script. A lot of times we put on our Sherlock Holmes hats. We go out on the internet to scour the internet to see what other podcasts have they been on? What other programs? Maybe they've been on a YouTube channel. And then I will listen to some of the other shows they have been on in my script writing team. And a lot of times we'll listen to see what they have already presented, what questions come into our mind. And then when we're writing a script, we'll say, well, on Jenny Muscatel's show, you said X. Now I'm wondering about why. Can you tell me more about this? It's a way for me to plug Jenny's show. And it's a way for us to get even more information. So it's a way to help out your fellow podcasters. And you definitely want to build a network with other podcasters. So what will make your podcast unique? With there being over 2 million podcasts, you don't want to be a carbon copy of everybody else's podcast. Go out, listen to other podcasts that are in your genre and find out what you like, what you don't like, and how you can make a difference in the world. I believe everyone has a podcast in them. Start by being a guest on other people's podcasts and figure out what it is that you like. Go to conferences like Podcast Movement, which will be here in Texas in August in Dallas. It's the largest podcast conference in the United States. And it will be a great way for you to learn more, to do networking, and to have a great time doing it. So I have done my time. How did I do, Susanna? Great. 20 minutes and 21 seconds. <laughs> okay, so that gives us about 20 minutes to do a Q&A for anybody who has any questions for me. Thank you so much, Anna. A big round of applause. And Anna felt that it was really important to have time for your questions. So while you're thinking of questions for Anna, I wanted to remind everybody that in order to get the sheet, the information sheet that Anna referred to, we've put Anna's email address in the chat box and please reach out to her. And then she also alluded to or mentioned a workshop that she'll be doing later in the summer or early fall. And I put information about that, but while people are thinking of questions, Anna, do you want to say a few words about that? Sure, absolutely. So if you want to reach out to me, it's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. I know that's a lot of <laughs> letters to have to type out, but that's the easiest way to reach me. For those of you who are listening to this and maybe can't see the chat, I thought it would be important for you to see that. You can always go to heart with, hearttoheartwithanna.com and I have a a website there as well. And there's a contact me button there as well. Or if you go out to heartsunitetheglobe.org, which is my nonprofit, there are contact buttons on the website as well. So there's all those different ways that you can reach me. My One of the other hosts that's in a program called Bereave But Still Me, where I'm the executive producer, Michael Lieben, he has been podcasting for five years with me. And he and I are going to be doing this Half day conference. We're really excited about it. We're limiting it to only 10 nonprofits. We want to help other people who have nonprofit organizations who have questions about how to get started and are uncertain on, you know, what microphone to use or how to use the software. We want to give them a jump start. And so that's what our workshop, the half day workshop, will be. And we'll be able to break into separate rooms and work. If not one on one, one with a couple of people, Nancy Jensen, who is a producer of Bereave, but still me, she'll be joining us. And I might snag a few more people so that everyone can have somebody to work with who can answer their questions. So great. Yeah. So they can get more information about that workshop by reaching out to you on uh, your email, Anna at heart to heart with Anna.com. Right. A, -A N A. So is Anna. Yeah, thanks. And uh, I see a hand. David, do you have a question for Anna? Yes, actually, I have a two-part question. The first part is, suppose I want to be interviewed on someone else's podcast. How would I go about getting on a show? And the second question is, assuming I have my recording all done on my Zoom H5, and I do a host show, how do I go from that recording to actually having it on the internet and accessible to people? Okay, those are two great questions. Number one, 
how do I get to be a guest on that, another show? That's a great question. When I was first asked to, if I wanted my own show, before I made a decision, I went out, I, the, I was approached by a producer for Voice America who asked me if I wanted my own show. And I said, before I committed, that I wanted to talk to at least two other people who were with Voice America, and I wanted to hear their experiences, and I wanted to listen to their shows. That was really important to me. In reaching out, my producer was really smart. He had me reach out to other people who had podcasts that he felt were a good fit for me. And in doing so, one of those people asked me to be on the show. <laughs> so that was really exciting. So a lot of times you find out through other people who know about podcasters, what is your topic area? So my nonprofit is involved with helping adults who are having reading problems. Okay. And have a cutting edge methodology that helps them improve their reading skills really fast. Oh, wow. Okay. So there's a new, we call this like search engine just for podcasts that I learned at the last podcast conference that I went to. It's called Ivy FM, I-V-Y dot FM. And if you go look at that, it's a directory of, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, maybe over a million podcasts. And you can type in literacy. You can type in reading, reading problems, something like that, David. And when you type in those keywords, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. When you type in those keywords, Ivy will show you all the different podcasts that are using those keywords. Then you can go listen to some of those podcasts and reach out to those people who have those podcasts. You would be amazed. So many podcasters are looking for guests. And somebody like you would be a perfect guest to have on their program. So when you reach out to them, you tell them, I'm working with a nonprofit to help improve the literacy of adults who have reading problems. I would reach out to the dyslexic community. I would reach out to the blind and uh, visually impaired community, as well as those with uh, learning disabilities. Those are all good keywords for you to put in and reach out to them. You will be amazed at how many people would love to have you come on their program. Now, part two, what do you do once you've got it off of your Zoom? You have the little device, the, the little recording device. You put it into your computer and you see all these sound waves. What do you do with them? There are a ton of programs on YouTube that can teach you actually how to edit. I don't have enough time to do that in just a Q&A, but trust me. Look for Audacity, A-U-D-A-C-I-T-Y. And there's more than one Audacity. So when you look for that on Google, and if you ask me for the handout, if you write to me at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com, I'll actually put the link in that handout. And that way you don't have to worry to try and find it because there's more than one Audacity. But the Audacity that is the program that you can use to edit your software is easy enough from, for a grandma from Texas to be able to do it. <laughs> so I know okay. you can do it too. Here's my question though. Let's assume for a second that I've recorded a host podcast. I've edited it. I have the sound the way I want it. It's all ready to go. How do I get it on the internet so other people can listen to it? That's a great question. So there are different platforms that you can use for that. That one of them is Libsyn. That is not one that I use, but I hear really good things about it. For people who are really tech savvy, I was not very tech savvy. I needed somebody to hold my hand. So I went to a different company. I went to Blog Talk Radio. They don't hold your hand a lot, but they had a studio. So that was really great. But Buzzsprout, I know it sounds weird, B-U-Z-Z-S-P-R-O-U-T.com is a platform and they are wonderful. In addition to helping you. They have technicians that will actually help you if you have problems. They also put out a podcast every two weeks to teach you about podcasting. And they have a whole YouTube series to teach you about doing that. So what I do is I sign into my Buzzsprout account and it says, do you have a podcast to upload? I say yes. And I upload it to Buzzsprout and Buzzsprout um, will allow me to connect to different distributors. So through my Buzzsprout account, I connect to 
used to be iTunes. Gosh, I feel so old. Now it's Apple Podcasts. I can connect to Amazon. I can connect to iHeartRadio. I connect to Spotify. All of those different really big names, they have an ability through Buzzsprout for me to connect to them. Now, sometimes I have to jump through some hoops, but what I love about Buzzsprout is they say, would you like to have your show on Amazon? Here's what you have to do. And they actually detail it for me. So I don't have to try and figure it out myself. And if I get stuck, there's always somebody at Buzzsprout that I can contact and say, I'm a little grandma from Texas and I need help. And they always take pity on me and help me out. So that is a, that's something that you don't necessarily get at Libsyn that I love about Buzzsprout. I also have an account with Spreaker. Spreaker, it's, it sounds weird, but it's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. That's another uh, platform that will act as a distributor. And I like them because they distribute to some places that Buzzsprout does not. And so they distribute to YouTube. Buzzsprout does not believe in putting audio only on YouTube, but Spreaker is okay with that. So I use two different platforms. And I will give you some more information in the handout that I will be sending to you, David. So just send me an email, Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That way I'll have your email and I can send you the handout that gives you a little bit more information. But I hope I answered that question adequately. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think I got an idea there. You, you have to find a company that will be able to hook your podcast up to the distributors and get it actually on the internet. And there are some that are free, like Anchor, but I prefer, and uh, Blog Talk Radio was free when I did it a million years ago. Now I think you have to pay for it. But I think a lot of times you get what you pay for. And um, Buzzsprout is not that much. I end up paying for Spreaker for a year because I get a month free, I think, if I use, if I get it uh, for a year. But when I give you the handout, I'll have my affiliate link there. So if you want to check it out, if you sign up with them, I think you get a little something and I get a little something. Likewise with Buzzsprout. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions or did that answer your question, David? Yeah, I think so. I think I got the idea and I will drop a email a request for the handout to get more details on the various ones that I can try once I get my sound files done. Great. 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 David, when you were talking, oh, sorry. When you were talking about, okay, I've got my sound file ready. One thing that I didn't know, but I looked into it, is that it's really good if you decide you want to have a podcast to go ahead and record your first three shows. Get that under your belt before you put it out there. And here's why. There are over a million active shows. There are over 2 million shows out there. There's something called Podcast Fade that you maybe never have heard of, but that's where somebody puts that first episode out and then they say, wow, this is a lot of work. I don't think I want to do that anymore. That's why there are 2 million, but only about a million are active <laughs> because it is a lot of work. But by the time you've done three, you've already established some of your systems. You already know if you really like it, if it is something you want to stick with. And that's another advantage to being a guest first is you get a chance to be out there on the internet without having to do all that work. They're doing all the work for you. But you can see if you enjoy it because it's, I'm not going to say it's easy, folks. It's a challenging experience, but I will say that it's totally worthwhile. I, today's show is number 371. For me, I love what I do. I wondered if after I did 100 shows or 200 shows, I would be done. Have we already talked about everything? But no, everybody has their own story. And I think there's something that can be learned from every single episode. So I don't see myself stopping anytime soon. But record those first three shows before you put it out to the world, because then you can release them in closer succession, because it can take a while to get a show. And you may have a guest who's, oh, yeah, I want to come on your show. I want to come on your show. And so you're like, okay, you'll be next week's show. And then their kid gets sick. And, or they get sick and they can't do it. If you have three shows already done, that gives you a lot more time to work with to get your next guest. 
I'm going to jump in because uh, Roseanne has raised her hand. Uh, Roseanne, please, what is your question for Anna? Do unmute if you... There we go. I wanted to know how often would you recommend uh, publishing a, show, a podcast? That is a great question. And that's something that a lot of people ask me. My show is a weekly show. And I think that's great for me. There are some people who do daily shows. And in fact, the last podcasting conference that I went to, there was a whole session on, should you do a daily show? And I thought, seriously, I can barely keep up with the weekly show. But I went ahead and went to the session anyway. And as I was listening to them, I thought, wow, maybe this is something I can do. Not all the time, but during heart month, during the month that we promote congenital heart defect awareness. What I loved about their presentation was they said, change it up. One day, do a two-minute podcast. The next day, do your 30-minute podcast. You can vary the amount of times, which I love about podcasting. It doesn't have to be any certain set time. And by having a daily podcast, the people who did the presentation said that their numbers went really high. They went way, way up. So on an average month, I get between 1,200 and 1,500 listeners to my podcast. During heart month, I did it. I bit the bullet. I did a podcast every single day. And that month I had over 3,000 listeners. Now, many months later, because part month was February. So now we're in June. When I looked at my May statistics, I had over 2,000 listeners. And I think one of the reasons I had more listeners is I've been going out on more people's podcasts. So more people are hearing about me that way. And I'm contributing to a magazine on a regular basis. So I know people are finding out about me that way. But I think that daily podcast, I think it really made a difference. Now, I am the executive producer of two other podcasts. They're monthly podcasts. That's all that those hosts can do. Once a month, it's a 30-minute show, they're about, and that's all that they can do. So I think, check your schedule. What can you do? How much help do you have a team behind you? Do you have somebody helping you with writing scripts if you want to use scripts? Do you have somebody doing the sound engineering if you don't want to do that? What about social media? How are people going to learn about your podcast? Do you have other people helping you? What I have discovered is, yes, you can go it alone, but it's very hard. If you want to be successful and really make a splash, you need to build up a team and then just go for it. But how often should you do it? It depends on your ability to find guests. If you want to have a guest driven, if it's host driven, what do you have to say? Do you have something to say every day? What I did for my daily podcast was every day was something different. Sunday was Heart Dad Sunday. And my husband, who's a heart dad, he did the interviews. Monday was Medical Monday. And it was all about medical devices. Tuesday was my regular show. Wednesday was Mental Health Wednesday, and I talked about a topic dealing with mental health and congenital heart disease. Thursday was Tasty Thursday. We talked about heart healthy recipes. So every so you can see what I'm getting to here. So every single day was something different, and every single day the length of the podcast was different from something really short, like Medical Monday could be just talking about what an ICD is. Could be a five minute podcast, whereas mine, where I have a guest, is always about thirty minutes. I hope that answered your question. Anybody follow-ups, Roseanne? Let us know if you have a follow-up. I don't. That helps a great deal. So some good suggestions. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. I think we probably have time for one more question. And if folks don't have a question, I have a final question. But I am going to look around the room to see if anybody's raising their hand or unmuting themselves to ask a final question question or two we might have time for two but i don't see anybody raising their hand or unmuting themselves so i will i will ask the final question and that is anna do you have any final words of hope for somebody who wants to start a podcast they work in a nonprofit organization they really want to amplify their mission talk about the work that they do or and or connect with others, either in their community or with similar missions, what kind of words of hope do you have for those folks? Thank you so much for asking that question, Suzanne. I think that's a really intelligent question. What I've been talking to you about doing might seem terrifying, and it doesn't have to be. The, the company that I started out with called Voice America, 
that was actually the ideal way for me to start out. It was in the days when we called it internet radio. We didn't even use the word podcast eight years ago. And Joshua called me. He was my producer. I had a general manager. I had a social media team. I had a person who created my logo. And I had somebody else who helped me find music. It was really nice. It was very expensive. But I had this big team that I was paying, and they helped me put all the pieces into place. Those teams still exist. Voice America still exists. That would be an option for some people. But even if you want to do it piecemeal, there's, there are organizations like Fiverr where you can now go out and you can find somebody who will do the sound engineering for you. Maybe you're afraid to deal with audio files. You don't know what to do with audio files. You can do the recording and then they can take those audio files for you and make it into something beautiful. What about social media? You can actually hire people to take care of your social media. And if you go to the podcasting conference, trust me, they have a room full of vendors and a lot of those different vendors are people who want to help you with these different pieces. So don't feel that you have to do it all by yourself. You can get a team. You can either pay a team or you can do what I do and let your volunteers be part of it. It's actually very exciting to be part of this. And there are courses. There are very helpful videos on YouTube to teach you what it is that you need to do. But like I said, I would start by being a guest on a program first. That gives you a bird's eye view about what your guests will be dealing with. But it also shows you how different podcasts come to be. And you can see what you like and what you don't like. So when you make your own podcast, you're a little bit better informed. That's good. So don't, you don't have to do it alone. So those are good words of wisdom and hope. And before we conclude today's event, presentation and recording, if you're listening, watching this as a recording, and I want to ask you one more time to share your email address and also the information about your, your, your webinar or not webinar, but uh, training that you're going to do and also the names of your podcasts again, so that people can search for those and take a listen. <laughs> or, oh, yeah. And maybe be a guest. That's right. Uh, okay. Yeah, especially if they're watching this as a recording later on. So let us know how to get in touch with you. Okay. So the best email is Anna at heart to heart with Anna.com. You can go to my website, heartsunitetheglobe.org. There's a contact button on that. So that's another way that you can reach me and you can learn about congenital heart defects around the world. The program I do is heart to heart with Anna. It is for the congenital heart defect community. I'm the executive producer of Bereaved But Still Me. Unfortunately, many members of the congenital heart defect community have to deal with loss and bereavement. Sadly, a lot of our members die much sooner than we would like for them to due to the complexity of their heart defects. And this podcast was to help that community. What we discovered once we got into it was we didn't only want to talk to parents who had lost children or grandparents who had lost grandchildren. And so that podcast has opened up to talk about all kinds of grief and loss. So we're very interested in talking to people about all different kinds of loss. We've done episodes on suicide. We've done episodes talking about Holocaust survivors and death by so many different uh, methods, not just congenital heart disease. So if you are bereaved, that would definitely be a program that you could be a guest on. So check that out, Bereaved But Still Me. And I'm also the executive producer for Guerrero So Corazon. For any of you who speak Spanish, I'm sorry if I did not say that perfectly, but I do not speak Spanish fluently, but I am the producer of a program that is like Heart to Heart with Anna, but it is for the Latino community. All of the people who are working on that podcast are bilingual. And so they are helping people in the Latino community who have children with congenital heart defects just like I'm doing with Heart to Heart with Anna. So those are the podcasts that I'm most involved with. And <laughs> the workshop, you asked about the workshop. So Michael Lieben, who is the host of Bereave But Still Me, and who has a, a degree in production and has worked with radio and has even more experience than I do. He and I will be working together 
to help 10 different nonprofits get their podcast up and running. We're going to talk to you about helping to discover your why, helping to discover who your ideal audience is, helping to create the format that will work perfectly for you. We'll be giving you templates that you can use to do lists, those kind of things that we have used that we have found to be helpful on a daily or a weekly basis. And we'll discuss equipment. We'll show you how we write scripts and put uh, scripts together with our intake form. We'll be sharing all of that information with only 10 nonprofits because we want to give as much personal uh, attention to each of you as we can. And we want to listen to what all of you want. So we'll be doing that either late summer or early fall. And I put the promo code for a discount to that in the chat box. That's right. Any of you who are listening to this, who decide to sign up with it and let me know when you send me an email for the handout at, to Anna at heart to heart with Anna.com, we will be giving you half off of the cost of the workshop. Thank you. That's great. So that concludes our session. And I'd like to thank you all for coming.